Hello, my name is Samaya Sheikh and I'm a scientist in Sweden. I'm also the co-founder of um, Old News Science Platform. Um, here we're talking about Covaxin. We just um, released its phase three, the most anticipated phase three trial uh, so far um, in a preprint study, which is not peer reviewed, um, but it is on a platform um, uh, that uh, uh, that is uh, bioarchive or met archive uh, where scientists put their publications before peer review so everyone can see the data. Now we've analyzed the data and um, um, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, J. Rao, uh, Dr. Jami Rao from the UK uh, is a public health physician uh, talking about co-vaccine with us today and uh, we have Priyanka Pulla, uh, who is uh, one of the finest health journals in India and also writes for Bayer um, uh, and Mint. So uh, here we are, welcome both of you. Um, now uh, I'm gonna uh, start uh, uh, with Jay and uh, I'm gonna uh, ask Jay about uh, co-vaccine in particular. W what is co-vaccine and how is it different from the other Covishield or AstraZeneca Covishield in India? and uh, Sputnik and all the other vaccines that we've got. Uh, how is it different and um, uh, what's the technology behind it? Jay? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sumaya. Uh, Covaxin is India's, uh, India's original contribution to the whole vaccine enterprise. Uh, it is based upon a technology that Bharat Biotech in particular has used in the past as well. It is an inactivated whole cell, whole virion, uh, vaccine. In other words, they have they they obtained a a, a sample of the of, of the virus from the ICMR and National Institute of Virology, and then grew it in what are known as the viral cells. That is then inactivated so that it cannot replicate in the body, and that is then added to an adjuvant. The adjuvant part is important. It's another bit that Bharat, Bio Bharat Biotech claim is an important contribution, and that is their vaccine. It differs significantly in terms of the technology because the Pfizer vaccine is an mRNA vaccine in which no live virus is used at all. It is merely a small protein molecule consisting of a few of, 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 of a fragment of the mRNA which enters the cells, stimulates the production of the spike protein antigen, and that is what sparks off the antibody response. Oxford's, Oxford AstraZeneca's vaccine product, which is also this, which is the same as the uh, as, as the Serum Institute's uh, Covishield, is, is, a, is again quite different because they have got the spike protein uh, element added on to an existing coronavirus uh, vaccine, which does not cause infection or harm in the human beings, and that is that is their uh, their product. Sputnik again is slightly different, but Bharat Biotech is a whole virion virus particle. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jimmy. And so what, the, what it is in uh, layman language, it's a dead virus that goes in and produces the same type of uh, immune system reactions as the live virus does without replicating and infecting people. Um, so wonderful. Um, I just want to understand a little bit or want to help people understand a little bit about the history and what happened during the trial. It's one of the most awaited trials and probably published at the very end of how vaccines are administered. Thousands have been given or hundreds of thousands have been given and we have now come to a point that we just have the phase three efficacy data, um, which is fairly late. Now Priyanka, you've done a lot of reporting on how um, the history uh, has been in terms of recruitment and uh, some of the problems associated with recruitment from the power of biotech. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, as I'm sure most of our viewers know, um, this vaccine, when it was uh, given an accelerated approval in India, uh, the phase three trial was uh, neither complete nor, nor it had uh, the results weren't out and nor had it finished recruitment of all its participants until then. So it basically got its accelerated approval in India on January 2nd. Um, it was only after that, maybe about five or six uh, days after the accelerated approval, that they said that they had finally uh, uh, managed to recruit all the participants, some 25,000 uh, um, uh, 700, uh, 800 participants. So that happened on January 7th. Um, 
So once that happened, uh, uh, the first time we heard of any sort of results from uh, Bharat Biotech was on March 3rd. Uh, that's when they shared with us the so-called first interim efficacy analysis. So that was their estimate of efficacy based on a very small number of participants, uh, 43 participants who had developed COVID. So, uh, and, and based on that, uh, they came to the, uh, they arrived at an estimate of 81%. Um, uh, and then subsequently, April 21st, they came up with another estimate of efficacy. Uh, this was based on 127 COVID cases. Um, and that is when they said, look, we have 77% uh, efficacy. Now, uh, and by, by that time, you know, tons and tons of people had been vaccinated and, you know, the phase three trial is still going on. Uh, so after the April 21st estimate of efficacy was out, there was a bit of an unexplained gap, right? Um, before they released the final results, which everybody wanted. So the, the, the plan was to do the final efficacy analysis with 130 COVID cases, right? Uh, whereas the second interim efficacy analysis was done at 127 cases. Now, you would expect that, you know, on April 21st, when these results were out, when COVID cases were rising in India, that was the time when the second wave had already started, you'd think the jump from 127 to 130 would take a day or two or a week at the most. So many of us were expecting the results to come out, the final efficacy analysis to come out almost immediately. Uh, but that didn't happen. There was like a huge uh, you know, a two, three month gap. And there was a, a bit of anxiety amongst people because, you know, people are getting accident. They were like, where are the phase three results? Because nobody you, had it. Yeah. Do you expect any changes to happen between now and what is going to be published out? Uh, because there was, you know, this unexpected period. Do you expect that when it finally gets published in uh, a, an actual journal after peer review, do you expect this to change much? Uh yeah, I well, there are so we already now on July 2nd is when the final efficacy analysis came out, and it leaves a lot of questions which I uh, hope we're going to discuss. But I, I do hope those questions are answered because uh, there are quite a few gaps in uh, uh, the, the number hasn't changed from the second efficacy analysis, it's just that we don't understand what happened, uh, right. And, yeah. No, yeah. I, I mean the I, I mean the final publication when they actually publish in a journal. Do you think what has come recently, a couple of days ago, is that going to change between now and then, or are they going to stick to the same numbers? Well, I, I certainly hope. Uh, look, the, I don't. I can't. I can't make any guess about the number. Uh, but I certainly hope uh, they address some of the gaps. For instance, uh, you know, uh, questions have been raised about the people who were seropositive at baseline who had infection uh, when they were vaccinated the first time. That was 30% of the participants. However, they did not present any efficacy estimate for them. They just removed them from the final analysis. So I hope that is addressed. I don't think it will change the 77% number, but it will still give us more information about the vaccine, which we want, right? right. So uh, right now we're just all focusing on the headline number, but there's a lot else going on in the paper. And I think there is potential for that to change if right. they address all our questions. Yeah. One thing that you've been very vocal about is Priyanka was how the recruitment was conducted and who were the participants and uh, there were participants where some of there was some ethical concerns around recruitment. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, all these ethical concerns were raised around one particular trial site, which happened to be the biggest uh, trial site. Uh, so this entire trial had 25,800 participants. That particular site had 1,700 of them. Uh, that was in Bhopal. It was a private hospital. Um, so soon after the vaccine got its accelerated approval, a lot of these participants started saying, look, we didn't know we were in a trial. Uh, they told us it was a vaccine drive. Uh, they basically, you know, uh, apparently a van went through the neighborhood with a loudspeaker saying, Tika Karan, uh, uh, you know, a vaccination drive is going on and you will be paid for it. So those are the allegations. Uh, and many of these participants came from uh, poor communities, uh, unlettered communities, tribal communities, and uh, Indian law requires them for historical reasons to be consented in a special way. Uh, there's a requirement for video consent, uh, and that was apparently flouted. Not apparently, we know, we know now for a fact that there was no video consent for these communities. The investigators have accepted that. Um, 
but that wasn't all like many of these participants when they fell ill after either the first or second jab when they try to approach uh, the hospital for treatment the protocol requires them to be treated but uh, the participants version of events gives the impression of a very haphazardly managed trial site because they say they were driven away uh, you know, I spoke to a couple of participants who said we gave, we came. I, I went to them when I had some, you know, fever and all, and they said, "Apka yaha pe nahi hoga, ap si private hospital mein jaiye." So um, that happened with a whole bunch of people, right? Uh, there was one elderly gentleman who fell sick. He didn't even know he had to go to people's hospital. They did not clearly communicate to him that he was eligible for treatment. So, so there, there a lot of people who experienced post-jab adverse events uh, and even serious adverse events, but did not know where to go. Um, uh, so, so, so like the, the, the impression I got while reporting on it was like, you know, it, it really didn't seem like a very well streamlined uh, procedure. So no. Okay, so the, the, the paper has reported some of the adverse events and we know that there are certainly some associated with every single vaccine, no matter which particular one it is, but you've seen these people getting a specific type of adverse events. Now, uh, one of the biggest, um, besides uh, it's, a, it's that an Indian vaccine, it's got, uh, uh, it's got protection even from asymptomatic cases. Uh, one of the biggest uh, highlights of this vaccine is that it's got lesser adverse events in comparison to others. Now, since you've already spoken to these people who may have had adverse events, uh, particularly of the extreme kind, um, can you talk a little bit more about those adverse events and how they were managed? And uh, is there a one a case that particularly stood out for you? Yes. So what? Uh, so, so firstly, there are two kinds of adverse events they were tracking. One is the so-called solicited adverse events, which you expect after any vaccination, which is pain and redness and fever, etc. Where the protocol was that they call them up every single day. Um, and I believe that wasn't done properly. I know that many of the participants didn't have phones, so uh, and they didn't know how to write. So both modes were sort of compromised. That wasn't collected properly. These are the minor solicited adverse events. What concerns me even more is the serious adverse events. Uh, so, so I spoke to the family of a participant who died nine days after the first jab. Um, and his case was uh, the the trial wasn't unblinded, which means nobody knew then whether it was uh, you know vaccine or placebo what he got, but they put it down to a poisoning, the death to poisoning. But I I subsequently came to know that the family's version of events wasn't taken into consideration by the investigators. So they were saying he was feeling sick right after the jab. Um, he was vomiting, he had, you know, uh, uh, fever, etc. for several days, but the investigators didn't know. Um, and, and I also got to see the causality analysis. Uh, a document was sort of leaked by somebody and uh, the family shared it with me. And it, 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 it was a bit of a superficial analysis based on which they concluded that it had nothing to do with the vaccine and it was due to poisoning, even though no poison right. was found. So, so that bothered me because, you know, investigation into serious adverse events is, is extremely critical. That's why you're doing a phase three trial, right? Right. And uh, one of the things that uh, I read the paper myself and one of the things that um, uh, makes me wonder, they were, so the paper clearly suggests that people were followed up every second week on a phone call um, for symptoms. Um, so because they are claiming that they were symptomatic, um, they were, the vaccine even protected uh, the people from symptom, asymptomatic infections, which is an infection without any, any type of physical experience. So we're not talking about even mild symptoms here. We're talking about you feel nothing. You, you don't even know that you have a symptom, but there is virus in your body replicating and there might be some changes. So um, if you do an RT-PCR, you will find them positive, but you will not even know, like the patient would not know. So um, one of the things that they listed it as, they were contacted every second week. Now you are saying that some of these people didn't even have phones. Were they contacted every second week and how, um, compliant were they in terms of follow-up because they have to go back every single month to the hospital to, um, uh, to do an RT-PCR check. Um, and in that process, they also, um, they also count in uh, whether they had any asymptomatic infections or not. 
or symptomatic infections for that matter. So on the phone, they were asking if you've had any symptoms every two weeks. Was that done with these particular cases? And do you find any abnormalities in the process? So uh, what you're talking about, I think that there are three categories of clinical trials and what you're talking about uh, clinical trial sites. Uh, and so the asymptomatic tracking was done at one of the categories. And I'm not entirely sure if Bhopal was one of them where they were right. tracking asymptomatic. I think maybe it was category A, which is only symptomatic. So right. I, 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 I suspect they were not part of that. Sub right. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that they were not called back um, every now and again to check on them. Is that what happened? Yeah, so I know for a fact that the protocol that applied to that site, they were, at least amongst the people I spoke to, they were like major deviations. Right. Um, and that, that number probably runs into hundreds because we know this because there are activists working with them there who very diligently tracked what happened. So it right. seems substantial, it seems like a biggish problem. Yeah. Right. So um, co-vaccine, just to let you know that uh, it had more than 25K total recruitment um, um, participants recruited and half of them went into the placebo arm, which is basically saline, and the other half got the actual vaccine. Now, out of those half and half, which comes down to about 12 point something K, um, the numbers really came down to just under 17, uh, so 16,900 something participants from 25,800 to 16,900. Now, that's a huge drop where they, the the 25,000 were included in the safety data, but only under about 17,000 were included in the efficacy data. Now, why did there was a drop in this number, a huge drop in number? Um, why did that happen and things like that? I want to ask Jay, what do you have to tell about this? And um, what are some of the concerns here when uh, you drop that kind of amount and you, you remove the participants from the trial data? Uh, you're on mute, Jay, so you'd have to unmute yourself, yeah. Good question, Samaya. The basic efficacy analysis, the headline result, is pretty is, is pretty clear. If that's all you read, then, then the takeaway message that the casual reader might pick up is that Covaxin has got an efficacy of 77.8%. But that figure is based upon an analysis of the 130 cases they had, 100 cases, 130 symptomatic cases of coronavirus that occurred in the trial participants, not in the original 25,800 25, people who were given the vaccine or the placebo as the case may be, but in the 16,973, and as you said, just under 17,000 uh, patients uh, subjects who were followed up. So that drop is accounted for by two factors. So just to keep those two figures in mind, 25,800, approximately 26,000 and 17,000. That is a 35% drop. And that is accounted for by 30% who were um, infection positive. In other words, they had, they had some evidence of prior infection with coronavirus at baseline. Though they, though they were known to have had some exposure to the coronavirus at baseline, they were still included in the, in the number of people who were given the injection because the original protocol was uh, aimed at detecting the protective effect of the vaccine, not only in virus naive individuals, but also in virus infected individuals in the past, because we know that a past infection is no guarantee against future infections and the vaccine affords additional protection. So that's a minor deviate, that's a deviation, if you like, from the original trial protocol. But a 35% drop made me investigate whether other vaccine trials had a similar problem as well. And I looked at the Pfizer study. The Pfizer study is interesting. They also had a sufficient, a different number for the ultimate, for the final efficacy analysis from the original number of people who were randomized to receive either the placebo or the vaccine. They had num numbers in the category of 44,000 people who were given the injection one way or the other, either placebo or the vaccine. And the number on whom the actual efficacy studies were done was, uh, efficacy calculations were done was around 37,000. So they had approximately a 13 to 14% tail off in these numbers. The Pfizer vaccine does something more in, some, something more interesting in their, in their report. They reported the efficacy calculations on both the number who had not had infections 
before the follow-up period started, and the number who had had infection. That is missing in the COVAXIN report. In the COVAXIN phase three uh, preprint that we are looking at, that number, what happened to the 30% who were previously infected, infected as judged by Either, either, either antibodies or an RT-PCR test in a small number of cases, we don't know what effect the vaccine had on, the, had on them because that data is just not presented. Right, right. Uh, interesting. So there's the, a lot of uh, uh, data that hasn't been talked about in the way that other people have talked about. For example, um, AstraZeneca and all the other major co-vaccines even talked about how there were um, uh, you know, various gender differences, for example, various, um, you know, I, I mean, there are gender differences here, uh, but it's not, uh, you know, in terms of side effects, in terms of, so there's so many other things how uh, gender can impact you um, in the way that vaccine is given. And um, there are like a, a tinier nuances where there are pre-existing medical conditions and then how those can affect you eventually yeah. um, um, in the way that uh, you might have reactions. Um, and uh, also, also the fact that, you know, age can have a differential. So there are so many other um, factors such as these individual variants that were not factored in. And I really hope that um, the phase three that comes in a paper form in an actual journal talks about these smaller awesome. nuances. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I just want to, I just want to talk about how uh, the side effects um, uh, were, you know, laid out, uh, you know, this is very uh, interesting to me. I, I had long COVID and I had um, a, a similar reaction to vaccine uh, as I had in long COVID. Of course, uh, it wasn't stretched out to that kind of period. It was only brief for a very small percentage of time, but I'm really interested in how uh, the side effects and then some of the concerns come out um, because most people have vaccine hesitancy, have concerns around the vaccine because of these particular side effects. I mean, there was misinformation that uh, you will die in two years after taking the vaccine. Um, of course, the blood clots has added to the major, major vaccine hesitancy across the world, um, not just in India. I mean, there, in Australia, there are vaccines that have been thrown out because people are not taking AstraZeneca. They've started giving Pfizer now, but imagine um, perfectly good vaccines expiring and getting thrown out, while Africa has a very, very small proportion who's getting access to these vaccines. So uh, there's major problems uh, uh, that we saw and and of course, media also highlighted it disproportionately. Yes, there are problems with blood clots, but it's a very, very small percentage. Um, but as long as you're clear, as long as the government and the vaccine um, um, a company is clear and giving out data, say week by week or every second week at least, the vaccine hesitancy can be tackled. And the fact that these um, major ethical problems existed and data wasn't given out in, in the way that it should have, um, uh, many people. Uh, have the vaccine hesitancy in India, not just towards COVID shield because of uh, the blood clots, also towards co-vaccine because the data wasn't just published. Now, uh, for me, one of the major concerns was um, why the vaccine side effects were not labeled out. I mean, I talked about it in my um, in my um, thread that I uh, that I posted around. Um, uh, this data, but uh, one of the major problems was how they did not differentiate between different um, uh, uh, between different uh, concerns that were uh, essentially side effects. Uh, one of the uh, one of the person uh, recruited uh, actually had a, um, a ovarian cancer, and there were multiple metastases. Uh, related to uh, the ovarian cancer. And uh, they just uh, put one sentence in adding that there were sudden cardiac arrest. They were, you know, uh, one of um, uh, the, you know, there were these ovarian cancers and these major uh, problems due to which uh, the people passed away. Um, yes, there were uh, more people uh, who had, um, um, uh, you, you know, there were more people who had a lesser kind of milder adverse events that is expected anyway with all vaccines that were given, um, but particularly um, with co-vaccines, a lot of people are touting that the side effects are not statistically significant between the vaccine and the placebo arm. So um, the total serious side effects uh, were just uh, 99, and uh, there were less uh, serious side effects in vaccine, which were only 39, and uh, in the placebo arm, which is basically saline water or a vehicle, um, it was about 60. 
so uh, they're really talking about how placebo had higher amount of side effects. Uh, and, and there were no, of course, there were no cases of anaphylaxis of, or vaccine related deaths. Um, but, but I really wonder if they're talking about um, uh, side effects that were um, severe and uh, there were specific deaths that happened because of COVID, uh, because of um, uh, causes that they're talking about like cerebral hemorrhage, uh, stroke and cancer and sudden cardiac death. Uh, what are these sudden cardiac deaths? You know, are these, how do we define that they're not related to cancer? How do we define that the cerebral hemorrhage is not related to the vaccine? Um, there were uh, two unknown causes uh, and uh, they don't know, they did not investigate or did, they, did, they could not investigate, um, but there were 10 in placebo and there were five from COVID and there were two with unknown causes, uh, but there were five deaths in vaccinated people um, they, 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 that they could not figure out um, uh, what was the reason. And I think uh, every side effects specifically of the severe kite but also of the mild and moderate kite should be laid out and they should talk about the percentage of people getting these. And I really hope this is also resolved. Um, but one of the good things that I found in the paper that a lot of the people had at least one comorbidity. Um, so out of the um, total number of people, around 7,000 or so had at least one comorbidity. And um, yes, it is India and most people have uh, things like diabetes and cholesterol and weight gain and stuff. But um, it is very interesting to see that they did include those people um, and they did not um, you know, test only on healthy people. It's very important because so many people have these problems um, on day to day and these are just managed problems. These are not severe illnesses. Um, I'm glad they included it. Uh, last uh, point that I am concerned about in this um, trial that has come out is as that they're claiming that the vaccine and the only vaccine that is claiming this way is protecting them from asymptomatic illnesses. Um, now, uh, if you read the paper, the way that they're measuring this is uh, they're calling them every second week on a phone call and asking them if they have any symptoms, right? But if you're asymptomatic, you will not even know that the virus is replicated in your body. The virus will be there, but you will not even have even a mild symptom. Now, they are supposed to come every month to the clinic to do an RT-PCR to find out whether they have um, any infection, even if they don't know about it. And this is how you test against an asymptomatic infection. Now, it is very possible, very likely, that if you come every month, um, only once in a month, you can get an infection and recover from it within the 15-day period. So if there are some... 12,000 people or 16,000 people coming in, um, which was the number, 16 to 17,000 people coming in and getting tested every single month to the clinic, doing an RT-PCR, they may have gotten the infection and recovered. And most people get a mild or an asymptomatic version. A lot of people could have been missed out completely. So I'm not really sure if this claim of um, protecting from asymptomatic infections is true. I think people need to read the data a bit more carefully and understand how the methodology was conducted. So even though I don't believe in it, yes, there might have been some people who didn't get the asymptomatic infection, but there could be also people who got it and recovered. So testing once a month uh, is probably not the best idea. At least every week or every second week, it should be tested and people are not the most compliant. So dates can be kind of shifted and rescheduled. So that is one of my big concerns um, with this particular data. The last point that I think is a major concern and I, I'd like Jay and Priyanka to add to this is that um, uh, all the authors um, were either from Bharat Biotech or ICMR and a couple of uh, study sites across India. Now, um, they could be people from the hospital um, where the vaccine was studied. But the first author, uh, Dr. Rachis Allah, which is like most significant order, it will also always be called Ella et al. Um, if they publish this paper. And he's the son of um, the chairman and the MD of the company, Dr. Krishna Ella, who owns the company. And Dr. Krishna Ella is the last author. So I think the last authorship is, I think, shared between the two Bharat employee, um, Bharat Biotech uh, people one is Dr. Krishna Ella and one is um, uh, another guy. Um, he's also part of um, uh, Bharat Biotech. His name is Krishna Mohan uh, Vadrebu. 
and these are both the last authors. Now, last authors are very significant. It means that it's in their lab that the study was conducted, etc. They were the one funding it. Now, conflict of interest that is dismissed in India right now is that they are the ones earning um, the money or profiting from the, the vaccine sales. They are the one doing the study. They are the one who's designed the methods. So they want to show a good result. Now, science is a lot about, well, science is not really about trust, but the process is very much trusted. Like if I do an experiment, which is molecular in nature, I can only show the numbers in the paper. They don't know whether I have actually done the experiment or not in my lab. So it's a lot about trust. Now, when you have a huge conflict of interest, People can say, yes, it's up to the authors to read, but do Indians really have a choice? Or any, does anybody else really have a choice when it comes to this vaccine? No. Um, so it really kind of questions the, the integrity of the study when these numbers are given. Again, um, with their claims of asymptomatic infections, we can clearly see that the testing was not done correctly. Everybody knows that you can get better in 15 days if you have a mild version of the disease. If you check every single month, you might as well miss it. So. There, there are concerns that, that shouldn't have um, existed in this paper, but at the same time, uh, there are good results as well. So, you know, with the conflict of interest, uh, we still have to take this with a pinch of salt. Again, this is an academic discussion. We still agree that unanimously that everyone should take the vaccine, but um, there is problems with the conflict of interest. I just want to know from you, both of you, how do you see this particular issue? Um, it, it's ethical at the same time, it's not exactly a scientific problem. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Rao, I would want to hear from you about uh, this particular issue. Indeed, I'll just comment firstly on the, on the various uh, levels of efficacy, if you like, and right. the asymptomatic infection problem that is of, of considerable public health importance uh, and, uh, and interest because it would be wonderful to have a vaccine that actually stopped asymptomatic infection because that way you could claim that it will actually arrest the spread of, uh, of the virus and therefore it will prevent transmission. Now, most vaccines have failed in that regard. Almost all vaccines we, that, that we have at the moment are more effective at preventing severe infection, hospitalizations and deaths. And, but they are not as good at preventing milder symptomatic infections and certainly not as good at preventing asymptomatic infections. So as an example, um, uh, in this country, for example, in Britain, for example, the early hope that the vaccine would stop the virus in its tracks has not been borne out. The virus is still circulating, but the virus is still the, the vaccine is still valuable because it prevents hospitalizations and deaths. What it does have, the implication of that, of course, in terms of public health policy, is that we continue, we continue to practice social distancing, wearing a mask, uh, travel restrictions, and so on and so forth, unless and until everybody is infected. And then hopefully, at the very worst, we can regard it as a minor irritating infection that people might pick up now and again, but will recover from, provided they've had the vaccine. In a country like India, where the vaccination rate is still not very good, it's about you know five six percent total total immunization, about 20, 22 percent one dose. The implications are of course even of, of even greater significance. So that deals with the, with the question of the of, of the asymptomatic infection. And I take your point that they may not have um, they may not have successfully measured all as asymptomatic infections or caught them. But even taking their own data at face value for asymptomatic infections, the efficacy of uh, of the Covaxin uh, product is really sixty four percent. Compared compare that with the seventy eight percent of the total symptomatic uh, efficacy. Uh, and that has got a huge confident, confident interval because of the small numbers. It varies from 29 to 62, to, 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 from 29 to 82 is the confidence interval for the efficacy. Can Again, you talk a little bit more rate. about the confidence interval? What does it really mean uh, to a layman? Right. That depends very much upon the number of cases on which the calculation is based. So, so what does it mean at, to have a higher confidence interval? If you have a large confidence interval, it means that your estimate of the efficacy is very shaky. It's very imprecise and probably is not reliable. And therefore, the estimate of the efficacy that we have for asymptomatic infection is probably highly unreliable. But 
And by the same token, the estimate that they that they have presented and that we accept now for the symptomatic uh, infections is of, of 78%, 77.8%, has a much tighter confidence interval of between 65 and 86. So we can have some, we can have a fair degree of confidence that the vaccine does prevent symptomatic infections. That's, right. my, that's my bottom line takeaway conclusion, if you like. Right. I just want to add one little thing on top, since you've talked about the confidence interval. Uh, we had looked at a previous study published by Bio Biotech in this International Journal of Travel Medicine that talked about how they were dealing with the UK variant or the Kent variant, as it is said. And uh, there were a small number of people who had received um, uh, this particular uh, uh, co-vaccine co uh, in India, and then they compared it with two other strains uh, found in India. Now, they had only looked at 38 people, um, but and this was a, a log PRNT50 value. Um, and what I had seen is that e even though the overall um, uh, standard error of mean, mean plus or minus standard error of mean was looking, um, uh, what it had non-significant differences between uh, the Indian uh, variant in circulation at that point, not the Indian variant as in the mutation, but the variant that we had initially in India. Um, versus the one that was the UK uh, mutated UK variant. Uh, there were not differences in uh, the antibody production. But in this particular um, paper, uh, they had listed out in independent values for each person out of those 38 people tested. Each person had a different um, uh, uh, kind of level of the of the um, uh, neutralizing antibody response. Now, what I saw because they were individual uh, data points for each person, what I saw was a large proportion of these people actually sat under um, uh, the uh, uh, you know it was it was lesser than uh, fifty percent of the uh, uh, of the required antibody. So what it meant was that they were quite um, low uh, in comparison to the other variant that was circulating in India. So all these people um, sitting in the middle, um, uh, you know, uh, otherwise uh, for, for the Indian variant uh, back then, uh, but there, there was a lot more people sitting under the 50% mark. So that's kind of made me wondering that if there are a smaller number of people who don't have neutralizing antibodies, uh, does that mean, and, and some people had a, a huge amount of neutralizing antibodies, does that mean that the vaccine is variable in in the amount of neutralizing antibodies it produces in different people. And if that's the case, we do really want to see individual data points here uh, for different people because uh, and, and, and also separate them out with either comorbidities or gender or any of the variants that could potentially impact the way our antibody response is in our body. Um, because this the concern is that this the small number of people, about 35 percent again, will not get the antibody response that everybody else was getting. Um, so, I, I mean, good on them for putting that data out, but we really need to have that kind of differentiation uh, in the phase three as well. Um, Priyanka, do you have any more points to add to this uh, whole discussion around um, uh, uh, not just the conflict of interest, but also how the symptomatic, um, uh, you know, the number of rare symptomatic infections and asymptomatic infections were talked about? Yeah, uh, so about the conflict of interest bit, uh, I fully agree with you. Uh, you know, Bharat Biotech probably should have made an effort to, um, you know, uh, uh, stay out of the conduct and the publication of the results of the trial. Uh, but in general, you know, this, this whole idea of independent oversight also extends to the trial and the issues I saw in Bhopal. So I'd like to sort of bring that in again, because um, uh, you had you have several layers of oversight there, there too, right? You have an ethics committee. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about um, uh, the lack of independent oversight of the trial, which uh, which was again a matter of concern in Bhopal. So when all this news about protocol variations, uh, deviations came out in the news, uh, one would have expected the ethics committee to take note of that and do something about it. If not the ethics committee, also because you know there were so many so many questions about how well serious it was 
events were, were analyzed and investigated, the DSMB had a role to play, which is again an independent body. Uh, it's more independent of the ethics committee, which also includes people uh, part uh, investigators on the trial side. And then on top of it, um, uh, the ICMR, uh, I don't know, I mean, of course they're a sponsor, I don't know how independent you can call them. And then eventually the Drug Controller General of India, whose, uh, whose job it is and who has in the past actually swooped in on um, clinical trial violations and looked into what happened. Uh, uh, so that's what they're supposed to do. But in this case, uh, I, I thought there was a bit of a, um, uh, you know, nobody seems to have done their job because the ICMR said nothing happened, uh, uh, which is a bit ridiculous because we know for a fact now that a lot of participants didn't even get to their informed consent forms. Now, this is this is so basic. It's it's a legal requirement. It's, it is in your new Drugs and Clinical Trials Act. Now, if the investigator, principal investigator actually comes on video and says, look, we gave them the form only when they asked for it. This is what he said. Now, if they say that there's, there's such a basic violation right there that you have to admit it happened, you can't say nothing happened. You know, maybe you can say this happened, but other violations didn't happen. But ICMR just completely dismissed the whole thing. So, so, um, and the DSMB did not speak up in sort of uh, uh, for the participants. So, so what I'm saying is, um, when we are talking about independence and conflict of interest, he, I feel like even the independent bodies which were appointed to oversee things uh, didn't seem to sort of come out and uh, uh, take a different stand when they should have. So what you point out about uh, authorship also bothers me. I, I think probably Bharat Bhaitik should have you know, stayed away from the content. That's right. Um, uh, there is another uh, one very quickly. We want to talk about the different variants that have uh, come, we've come across. I mean, last night, yesterday, we were talking about Lambda variants quite a bit. Uh, uh, and even though it's not come to India yet, it is in Britain, it is in Australia. It emerged from uh, Peru and so other parts of South America. Uh, but the one of the most, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the most uh, uh, the, the, the highest likelihood of having uh, a variant in India is the Delta variant. Um, yeah. the, other, uh, the other concern is that Delta variant is now at 90.7% uh, in, the, in the entire world. And uh, uh, two days ago when I looked at it, it was about 85% of the total world's um, coronavirus cases, but now it is 90.7%. And uh, they're claiming, uh, Bharat Biotech is claiming that the, the vaccine is effective, although every uh, vaccine has been slightly less effective uh, towards the Delta variant. Uh, Pfizer, as well as AstraZeneca, which is Covishield, is also less effective. Now, with 90% of the total world's cases, I really think that this is not going to be the last variant. There will be newer variants, um, such as the one coming from Peru, um, which is the Lambda variant. But at the moment, uh, what does the data say about Covaxin uh, on other variants? Jay, do you want to quickly wrap that up uh, before we go towards the end of it. Yes, uh, happy to do that. Uh, they did do genome sequencing, not, uh, uh, not perhaps uh, uh, for all cases, because in table three of their paper, and that's worth uh, looking, at, uh, looking at for anybody who's, who's sort of interested in it, they do present efficacy numbers. In other words, the number of infections they had in the vaccine group and the number they had in the placebo group by classified by the variant of concern. So to take the sort of Delta variant, for example, don't forget overall the numbers are, they had 24 cases in the vaccine group and 120 and, and, and 100 six cases in the in in the placebo group overall but if you look only at the Delta variant infections, at least those that they did uh, do the genome sequencing for, the numbers pan out uh, uh, as follows. 13 in the vaccine group, out of uh, the same 8471, 13 in the vaccine group, and 37 in the placebo group, giving them an estimated efficacy of 65.2%. In other words, two thirds of infections due to the Delta variant would be prevented. But that 65.2 comes with a huge, once again, back to the confidence interval problem, comes with a wide confidence interval of between 33 and 83. And that is because they had only, they had they had a rather much smaller numbers of 13 and versus 37 infections with the Delta variant. 
Now we don't, it's hard to know whether every single case was sequenced or not, because the total number of, uh, of uh, variants that they list over here do not add up to the total number of 130 infections. There's a large category known as all variant related COVID-19, and that accounts for a large chunk of most of the cases, 79 cases in the in overall. Uh, combining the sort of vaccine and the placebo group. So we don't know what the makeup of that category is because that is reported separately from the Delta, Kappa and the Alpha variant. Right. Um, I mean, uh, uh, since we were all talking about the Lambda variant, but um, I've seen the uh, COVE spectrum data, which is enabled by JSID, uh in India. And uh, uh, yes, we don't have the Alpha variant uh, as high as, you know, some of the other countries as Alpha variant has the most amount of mutations as well. Um, but uh, we have the Delta variant at 95%, 95.2% as the rest of the world. But there, we, we do have some other variants of the beta types, of the B1 uh, point types, uh, which are emerging. Um, yeah. And we haven't talked about that at all. Like, for example, the, the beta variant, as they're calling it, which is B1.351, uh, is quickly emerging as well. B1.575 is quickly emerging as well. Yes, it's not as high as 95%. It's only 0 0.6 and 0 0.4, respectively. But, uh, you know, according to what the kind of genome sequencing we're doing in India, it is still quite less and uh, the proportion is quite high. It's just come up um, uh, to this point where there are, uh, you know, estimated number of cases are as high as, you know, between two and 3,000. Um, it started off in the month of May. So I'm really worried that uh, mm. these two variants might, you know, uh, if not come close to the Delta variant, be um, one of the next variants of concern in India. Um, and because the genome sequencing hasn't been done, uh, we have such a large proportion, which a lot of number of cases, I really think that genome sequencing should be the thing to focus apart from vaccinations if we want to pick out the variants and mutations early on and do something about it if we need to. Um, we can't sit on them and, other, and let other countries find uh, the mutations for us. Um, uh, going to the last, uh, you know, a uh, couple of things, and we just kind of wind, round up, wind up the study. And what are some of the concluding remarks, just in a small, brief way? Uh, Jay, do you have anything to add towards the end? Is there something about the unblinding of the study that you wanted to talk about? And what do you think of the paper overall? Yes, the study we are now told in the paper very clearly is that it has been unblinded. That means that uh, the, uh, all subjects know whether they were given the placebo or the vaccine, and those who were given the placebo have been offered the vaccine or whichever vaccine they want to do, they, they can do it. It was unblinded, unblinded virtually two months after the final data point, uh, which was May 17th or so. It was unblinded around about June, I think it was unblinded, and, and, so, and, and so there we are. Now that has it. That has that presents certain problems. The original emergency use authorization that uh, that vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna got from the US FDA was based upon an understanding that they would continue to monitor the subjects who were enrolled in the study, not only for the for the continued efficacy, particularly against emerging variants, but also for the safety data. That opportunity was lost. Of course, even Moderna, mind you, six months six months on, did did unblind the study and effectively effectively the study ceases at that point. It does raise certain concerns really. One of those concerns is that a good a golden opportunity for ongoing study of efficacy of the vaccine against different variants that might emerge is lost. The second point to make is that the original completion date for, this, for the trial was set to be December 2022. In other words, that was when they estimated that they would uh, stop follow up of the study. That has now gone out the window because they have unblinded the study. Mounting a new study would be extremely expensive and extremely difficult. And therefore, in some small way, a small bit of regret that they unblinded the study quite so quickly. And whether they sought the, the regulator's permission or not is another interesting, interesting question that we don't know the answer to. Right. And do you have an estimate about how long before we get the real world data? Because mind you, this is just a clinical trial. We don't have the real world data. What UK is doing right now is releasing data every single week. Again, that Again, yeah. relieves people off a lot of vaccine hesitancy, regardless of, you know, the, the clots that people have been hearing, although it's 0.0.0016% 0 .0 of the population who have been found with these clots. But 
we're, we're still seeing, you know, what if I'm that unlucky person? And by releasing the data every single week, UK is doing a brilliant job. Uh, uh, you know, the NHS is really on top of everybody else. Do you uh, think that India would ever come to that point? Not every week, but when do you think you expect the real world yeah. data coming out on a regular basis? I mean, I don't hold out too much hopes for regular routine ongoing data monitoring, the data monitoring systems in India. That is not just a one off exercise that depends upon good public health systems in place, accurate reporting of data, both for, by hospital doctors and other people and so on. Most of the healthcare facilities in India are run on a for profit basis, and it is not in their interest to waste their time collecting and collecting data reliably and, and, and completely and feeding it up the chain. So we have not having invested in those data collection systems, for example, has led to several uh, lacunae in our data responsiveness. And one of the major concerns that even the Lancet Commission pointed out was that we lack the data uh, on, on the basis of which to make reasonable and quick policy decisions. So a classic example is the deaths data, for example. We don't even know how many deaths are, are, are occurring due to coronavirus, never mind whether they are being correctly classified or not. And in this situation, you really need good data systems and complete data systems. But we do have one strength in India, which is we have a good, unique identifier for each individual in the Aadhaar card. So it's possible to do it. But I was told in a, in a previous discussion with Gagandeep Kang and other people that there, were, there was some flaw in the forms to collect the information when people were going for vaccinations or when people come up with a case or have an RT-PCR test. The form doesn't ask the question, have you had a vaccine? And if so, which vaccine have you had? So the kind of case control study that the UK PHA mounted recently to show that it is still efficacious against severe infection, it would be difficult to do in a country like India unless we rapidly scale up and improve our data collection, monitoring and recording systems. Right, thank you very much for that, Jay. And Priyanka, do you have anything to add uh, just as one of your last points or just to add to what Yami said recently? Yeah, so uh, so I'm not sure about the weekly surveillance data you're talking about. Is I don't know. Are you referring to effectiveness of the vaccine on a weekly basis? And and uh, uh, so effective uh, efficacy and safety as well. And what UK is also doing is in is testing in several ethnicities in particular, which uh, uh, you know we now know that, uh, for example, one of the, one of the largest studies that uh, UK has is. Um, looking at how COVID affects different ethnicities and how um, um, Black and Asian people are more likely to get COVID. Uh, I don't know how it's their behavior, their practices, and all these different types of studies around human variation, which is otherwise a no-no conversation in biological um, uh, biological experiments. But here in particular, when it comes to uh, testing and infections, we, we do know the value of how uh, different infec uh, infections affect dif people differently and how they manifest, especially in, in a disease such as this, uh, which is already very varying um, in every individual. So UK has been doing a lot of those kind of studies. Has the vaccine been more effective in, in one group of people versus another? Um, gender in particular, and I keep talking about it all the time because uh, the vaccine as well as the disease does impact men and women differently. Do you expect any of these things to come out in the near future? And what are your final thoughts on this uh, particular study that has come out? So, so my answer is a big no. <laughs> Definitely not on a weekly basis because uh, so I'll tell you why. Um, these two vaccines, one of them, especially Covaxin, was uh, approved un under a very, very specific uh, um, a set of conditions, which is called a restricted use under emergency use authorization, which is even different from COVID shield, which is equivalent to the emergency use. And despite that, they did not launch an effectiveness study, uh, which you would imagine would be a legal requirement for a vaccine that, that is being launched before the efficacy data, but clearly it wasn't because Bharat Biotech did not do this uh, case control case negative study, which the UK, UK and all these countries, that is how they measure the effectiveness, you know, once the vaccine is rolled out in real life, nothing of that sort was launched uh, soon after these vaccines were approved. Uh, so we are starting on a very low base here. And in fact, the first uh, effectiveness study of this design, which is the case negative study, which the WHO recommends, was actually launched in April. Um, uh, so, so if the, the, the effectiveness data, large scale effectiveness data, we are only going to get a few months down the line. So, so we are already going really, really slow there. Uh, uh, there's, there's hardly anything. And you know what uh, Dr. Rao spoke about, uh, which the Ministry of Health had shared some in data on breakthrough infections. 
um, that was very ad hoc data. Like they never explained how they collected the data because in the first few months when people started get, getting vaccinated after January, uh, as he said, there was at, uh, the people, uh, anybody who developed a COVID inf infection, the, it would have helped if they could mention whether they were vaccinated or not in, in the uh, form, but they, that wasn't incorporated till very late. So what we know is that we've been actually going really, really slow on collecting this effectiveness data. I will be really happy if they, you know, come out with, you know, one paper <laughs> in a few months down the line on efficacy because we really don't have it. We only have it from hospitals right now. Um, so, you know, while, while I would love to see a, a weekly sharing of data, I think that's kind of far away. Uh, that's the first point I wanted to make. Um, the, the second point I wanted to make uh, before wrapping up is that um, I, I wanted to explain why I, I think it's so important for uh, the sponsors to handle to, to respond to these questions about irregularities in Bhopal, uh, because a lot of people have been asking this question about, you know, what's the big deal? It's just 1,700 people on the site. Uh, let's say, um, you know, you just remove those people from the trial. What's it going to change? The vaccine is still effective. Now, I want to say that is not true because um, uh, the, the trial has given us multiple sets of results. There is first the headline efficacy number, which everybody is so interested in. But apart from that, it's also safety in terms of mild adverse events, safety in terms of serious, uh, efficacy against uh, severe disease, efficacy in elderly people, and then efficacy against variants. Now, all these subgroup analyses are very, very sensitive to just one or two cases. So, you know, if you really account for the irregularities that happen in Bhopal, and let's say you you fail to uh, classify a COVID case as a COVID case because the person didn't come to the hospital, or you fail to classify as a serious adverse event uh, due to the vaccine because they didn't approach the system, I think that has the potential to affect the results in a way that will eventually impact policy also, not, not majorly, we'll never stop using this vaccine uh, because of this. It's, it's still a safe and efficacious, broadly a safe and efficacious vaccine, but over time we are going to make much more nuanced decisions about which vaccine to take. And then we need this data to be nice and clean and, and, and honest. So you do you guys think people have a choice in India which vaccine to take? Because uh, it was almost brushed it off as, you know, uh, well, it's given, uh, you know, the conflict of interest is given, you know, people know about these things, journalism, I mean, people like you report on it all the time. Do people really have a choice to make that decision which vaccine they want to take? I mean, we're talking about co-vaccine here, but Covishield also hasn't published uh, their data in India at the moment. And uh, Sputnik until much recently had not published it either. So it's not like this, we're targeting one particular company. There are other problems in the the way that science has been conducted and not just here uh, but also how the drug controllers authority has been um, approving a lot of the these drugs and much later uh, uh, the the doctors come in and say no this is not effective stop using it things like ivermectin things like you know uh, uh, inadequate use of uh, steroids well overdosing with steroids early on and you know, the, there were multiple problems in the way that covid was handled not just in india across the world do you really think that the problems in science um, would be addressed eventually because you know how from what we've learned uh, from this whole uh, the, whatever the shenanigans happen in the pandemic time do you think Indeed, uh, Maya, science is going to learn that question is relevant is, is relevant well beyond india right. uh, one of the little one of the little known and little understood uh, fact, uh, facts about uh, how vaccines were approved worldwide starting with the fda in december last year is that an, an emergency use authorization amounts effectively to saying that this is an experimental vaccine. We don't know everything about it, but because of the public health emergency, we'd better start using it. What That has two major implications. It is not a full authorization by the FDA. Even Pfizer hasn't got it. Even Pfizer at the moment is an experimental vaccine. Technically, I don't want to start a scare by saying it's an experimental vaccine, but technically, the fact that it's been used under an emergency use license means technically that it is a, 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 an experimental vaccine. Now, what that means is two things. One is the company cannot market it to directly to the consumer. 
which they can for other vaccines, which have been fully approved. And second, it places a burden, not only on the company, but also on the public health system of each country to continue to monitor both effectiveness, efficacy, and side effect profile, and put out the information so that people can make an informed choice. The third, I said too, but there is a third important implication. But do people is, have a choice really? You know, the governments are pushing well, this vaccine. Do well, they, they have a choice? They don't have a choice of which vaccine in India, but even but before you come to which vaccine, there's a choice of whether or not people take the vaccine. There is a strong libertarian movement starting in America, which says you cannot impose the kind of mandatory requirements to take the vaccine. Well, that, it is in uh, India as well. It's called in India, India against I, slavery. India, yes. I see. Okay. B because these are not fully approved vaccines. So in the case of Massachusetts, for example, a few, this is going back 10, 15 years ago now, when they had a spurt of cases of measles in schools, they passed a law requiring children to be immunized necessarily, compulsorily by law before they could enter a kindergarten or a, or, or a preschool, nursery school place. We have the same in Australia. So you can't get into school, yes. kindergarten or nursery if you don't have the MMR injection. MMR, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, because of measles and mumps and so on. Absolutely. Whereas you can't you can't have similar legislation in the case of Covaxin because no vaccine at the moment has got full authorization. And Absolutely. the trouble with full authorization is that you require long term follow up, and the long term follow up requires that you spend the money in order to monitor people who have the vaccine to to look out for safety and so on. Which is another good reason why India at least can can in my view get a jump start on this because because we are now starting on a level playing field with, with the whole world. We've got the manpower. We've got the scientific manpower to throw at the problem and collect the data reliably and put it out in the public domain so that anybody can analyze it. Right. Thank you so much for a very insightful analysis. Priyanka, thank you so much um, uh, for coming over and uh, giving that brilliant understanding of what happens at the back end. And uh, I hope we get to do more of these soon. I really sincerely hope that we understand a lot more about um, you know transparency ethics and you know how effective and safe these drugs are uh, specifically during the pandemic time phase three has nearly started uh, i'm not sure if you've been following up but every day we are seeing an increase in number uh, and people are just still in denial mode they're going on holiday especially in india i've seen so many trips uh, people are planning on uh, you know we also just not to um, be easy during this particular time it's just a small period we're going to go to phase three very quickly. And before that, vaccine is the only alternative. Uh, this is an academic discussion. That doesn't mean we don't agree with these vaccines, right? Um, thank you very much. And uh, um, I am just about to close this in three, two, one.